Hello and welcome to another episode in the Cancelled Game series where we have a look at some of the unreleased titles that never made it to a particular system. This time it's one that many of you have been asking for, the Xbox 360. Wow, the Xbox 360 has a lot of cancelled games and there was actually a lot of overlap with the PS3 and upcoming PC episodes so you'll see more in those. But for now, here's 35 of those cancelled games. The Little Prince was a 3D platform adventure game from French studio MKO Games, being developed in 2008 and 2009 for the Xbox 360, based on the animated series of the same name, which in turn was based on the novella. Released in 1943, the novella followed a young prince who explores Earth and various other planets, and featured heavily existential overtones and delved into the human condition, despite being a book written for children. Microsoft showed interest in bringing the game to the 360 after seeing this prototype created in 2008 and were keen for a second prototype to be made which would draw inspiration from the Little Prince's animated series. Neither made it past the prototype stage. There has been speculation that it was a hard sell given the source material, but the Little Prince is in fact one of the most translated books of all time and has seen success in various other forms of media. Demonic is an interesting one as it was being made to coincide with the stoner film Grandma's Boy, released in 2006. The game actually appears in the film, and developer Terminal Reality were involved in its production. I'll confess that I'd never even heard of this film prior to researching this, and it doesn't look like I'm missing much. Rather than just being a stunt for the film, Demonic was due to come out on the 360, and this trailer was shown at E3 in 2005. You would control one of several people who have summoned demons to do their bidding and are all seeking vengeance in some way. In another interesting twist, the story was written by horror master Clive Barker. Demonic was cancelled due to financial troubles at the publisher Majesco. Project Offset was a fantasy adventure game in development from Offset Software. It was initially planned for the Xbox 360, PC and PS3, and a considerable amount of time was spent developing the game's engine. The graphics, demoed at GDC in 2006, were causing quite a stir. Presumably Project Offset was just a working title for the game. It was described as a first person shooter set in an epic fantasy world, but the available footage does show gameplay in both first and third person, so perhaps the player would have been able to switch between these two viewpoints on the fly, much like games like Skyrim. There would be two rival factions battling it out, and each would feature several unique character classes from which to choose, with ranged weaponry including crossbows, and swords and knives for close quarters combat. There would also be rideable creatures including dragons, and manned medieval weapons. As well as promising an epic single player adventure, it would also have online multiplayer combat that focused on capturing, constructing and destroying key points across the battlefield. In early 2008 the studio was bought by Intel, making it a PC exclusive, at which point the game underwent several changes. It seems that these design changes ultimately led the team to cancel the project altogether, and they left to form a new studio. Cry On was announced in late 2005 by developer Mistwalker, very early in the Xbox 360's life, to be co-developed by Caviar. It was conceived by Final Fantasy creator Hironobu Sakaguchi, and would be an emotional adventure featuring gameplay in several genres. Set in the Middle Ages, the story focused on a young princess called Sally and her bogle, a small creature. These creatures protect and assist their human partners once allied, and were at one time giants. Now certain humans have found a way to return them to this gigantic form, and intend to do so in order to use them in battle. Sally's Bogle is the only Bogle in the land that can speak a human language, and she has the ability to transform it into a giant should she wish to, after being bestowed this power by her father the king. This transformation would be used to approach obstacles and challenges in the game, and the player would be able to control both Sally and her Bogle. 
Certain items could be connected to the Bogle which would affect its abilities and appearance, allowing the player to perform unique actions needed to overcome challenges, in particular traversing different types of terrain. When controlling Sally, the gameplay would be more of a puzzle-centric RPG, and when controlling the Bogle it would be more of an action game incorporating the combat. Sakaguchi stated that the game's title, Cry On, referenced the emotions he wanted to evoke while the player experienced the game, be it tears of sadness or joy. The whole game would have a very anime-like graphical style, as evidenced by the trailer. The game was cancelled by Mistwalker in December of 2008, but this trailer didn't surface until December 2014. Beyond a look at the graphics, it doesn't really give much away. Another game exploring the relationship between a human and a giant was Precore, being developed between 2010 and 2011 by Armature Studio, formed in 2008 by a team of developers that previously worked at Nintendo's Retro Studios after finishing Metroid Prime 3. They struck a deal with EA to produce several conceptual prototypes which, if appealing, would be passed to other EA studios for full development. One such project was Precore, a game set in a post-apocalyptic world featuring a human character accompanied by a giant robot. The footage isn't very telling and info is almost non-existent so I won't dwell on this one too much. EA closed the wing responsible for the relationship with Armature so the studio went on to work on other things. It's thought that some of Precore's assets made their way into Armature's similarly titled 2016 release, ReCore, as it featured some similar stylistic choices. Retribution was a first or third person shooter being developed for the 360 and PC in 2005 and 2006 by U235 Studios. This was in the works very early on before the 360 was even named and would use Artificial Studios Reality Engine. This tech demo was just as much a demo of the Reality Engine as it was of the actual game. The game was a shooter which allowed the player to choose whether to play in first or third person, which boasted a movie-like script and realistic environments. The game's overarching theme was seeking vengeance for your parents' murder, giving Retribution its name. The gameplay would allow the player to recruit a team, train them and complete mercenary missions to earn money which could in turn be spent on upgrades to the team members abilities, weaponry and equipment. Team members abilities would improve by either being placed in training in a specific area or by experiencing it first hand on missions. It would feature 11 distinct environments across single and multiplayer modes, a unique damage system and drivable vehicles including cars and boats. Mercenary missions would include taking hostages for ransom and stealing vehicles in order to sell them on, so there were several ways to make money. The game would also incorporate a system to monitor finances, although I'm not exactly sure how in depth this would have been. The Reality Engine promised a sophisticated team management system, realistic water and advanced art and physics capabilities. It obviously impressed Epic, who bought Artificial Studios in 2005 and the engine and studio were sort of absorbed into Unreal Engine 3. U235 Studios didn't find a publisher for Retribution and closed without ever developing a game. Necessary Force was an action game being developed by Midway Newcastle for the 360, PS3 and PC. An open world game played in third person, it saw the player control a cop tasked with cleaning up the city's scum-ridden streets. Despite this playable demo representing only three months of work from the studio, it looks pretty impressive with a fully formed engine and some quite nice lighting effects that depict a dingy, dark city environment. The city itself looks run down, littered with abandoned buildings, damage and graffiti, but as you played the game and cleaned up the streets, these features would gradually transform, breathing new life into the once neglected streets as some semblance of civilised society returns and new buildings and businesses are erected. Midway Newcastle was closed in 2009 when Midway's assets were purchased by Warner Brothers and Necessary Force was cancelled. A shame as even at this early stage it showed promise and the idea of playing an open world GTA like game on the other side of the law is quite intriguing.
Specs, also known as Tim Schafer's Connect Adventure, was a motion controlled adventure game from Double Fine. Whether this was a real game or just an experiment with Kinect's control interface we don't know, but if it's the latter it seems like quite an elaborate undertaking. The demo footage here was shown by Tim Schafer himself at NYU and details the rough idea of the game and the motion controls and shows the protagonist Thurston on his way to declare his love to his sweetheart. The premise was that you would interact with objects using either hand, with each hand representing a different emotion. The core idea was a hand for love and a hand for hate, but would also feature other emotions including fear and trust by use of gestures, for example folding one's arms would indicate disapproval or mistrust. The choices you make using your hands and gestures would affect the choices made in game and thus steer the story in a particular direction. Specs was described as a story of a cursed sentient artifact, so presumably the story would have progressed deeper than a mere love story, and knowing Tim Schafer and Double Fine would have been an amusing and well told adventure. Even in the demo footage we can see hints of Double Fine's brilliance, from the signature art style to the brilliant sense of humour. I have no idea what happened to Specs or why it was never released. Project Enwar was a third person shooter being developed by Digital Anvil for the Xbox 360. The prototype footage is very bare bones, but thankfully an in-depth design document details a great deal of information on the game. Set on the planet of Enwar, a vast world with various environments and races, you play as one of three characters, a warrior, a mysterious young woman, or a strange non-human traveller. The planet is under attack from some kind of parasitic system while also being at war and it's your job to prevent your world's destruction. It would feature an epic story driven adventure and combine action gameplay with RPG elements. The game would be open world featuring quests and the game world would be littered with enemies of various alien races as well as huge monsters and fantastical beasts. Each of the three playable characters would offer a different route through the game with unique missions with an accompanying storyline and each would have their respective unique arsenal of weapons. The three storylines would interweave at various points throughout the game. As the story progressed each character would undergo several changes including transformations in physical appearance and in their abilities and NPCs would react differently to the characters in response to this. The section of the design document covering the game's lore is extensive to say the least, too much to even summarise here but needless to say they clearly put a lot of time into envisioning the world of Enwar, its people and its socio-political history. This must have been in development very early on because the studio was closed in January of 2006 after being moved to Microsoft HQ at which point Project Enwar was also scrapped. Of all the games on this list, Beyond Good and Evil 2 is probably the most well known and the most anticipated. A prequel to 2003's Beyond Good and Evil from Ubisoft, this sequel was first born in 2007, headed to the Xbox 360 among other platforms. A teaser was even shown in 2008, before the game was put on ice the following year when the team were tasked with working on other projects and then a trailer emerged. Much to the disappointment of fans, all hope for the project fizzled out, but in 2017 Ubisoft announced the game's revival and in 2018 several new bits of footage were shown, indicating that the long awaited prequel had been reborn. Still, no details on release dates or platforms have been announced and it's unclear how far the concept has strayed from its original form, but fans can hold out hope that they will one day get this prequel. Urban Race was a parkour game in development for the 360 and PC from Tentacle Studios Belgium. Set across a fictional city, gameplay was a blend of parkour and free running, through obstacle courses comprised of elements typically found in and around cities, such as the interior and exterior of buildings, construction sites and architectural features. As well as utilising your character's best acrobatic skills and agility to win races, you could also execute attacks on rivals, like some sort of on-foot road rash. This trailer was released in mid-2008, and for the time the graphics looked pretty decent. 
the gameplay is nice and smooth, with fluid character animations, and most importantly, it actually looks like it could have been a lot of fun. Tentacle failed to find any interested publishers, and Urban Race was abandoned. Shadow Run The Awakening was being developed by Facet Interactive for the Xbox 360 and PC, and would have been the fourth entry in the Shadow Run series. A first person shooter, this was essentially an early version of what became their 2007 release for those platforms, titled simply Shadow Run, which was also a first person shooter, but online only. The initial concept, The Awakening, featured a full single player campaign, and was created using their own engine. At some point something obviously happened at the studio who knows what, and the project was restricted to contain the online deathmatch only. Highlander was a planned third person action game based on the Highlander film series being developed for the Xbox 360, PC and PS3 by widescreen games, to be published by Square Enix. The player would take control of Owen McLeod, an ancestor of the McLeods from the films and TV show, in a story set across the world in various time periods. The story was written by one of the TV show's consultants and began 2000 years in the past. Owen McLeod would encounter several historical peoples and other immortals, both friend and foe, some of which would be familiar to fans of the franchise and some unique to the game. He soon embarks on a quest to gather up the fragments of a magical stone in order to gain the power he needs to defeat the game's antagonist, divided up into 18 missions. Highlander was announced in 2005, but the first trailer wasn't shown until early 2008, and it gives absolutely nothing away. It just shows various environments, followed by an animation of the protagonist. The gameplay would heavily focus on close combat and swordplay, and being immortal, aside from being beheaded of course, Owen can take risks that would normally result in permanent death in other games. It would feature several fighting styles, and contrary to the source material, Owen would be able to use a selection of magic spells. The game's cancellation was officially announced in December 2010, so it seems there can be only none. The Lord of the Creatures was a fantasy action adventure game being developed by R Virago Entertainment for the 360 PC and PS3, announced in 2003. I described the gameplay as hack and slash with strategic tactical elements. The main USP was that the player would be able to capture monsters and creatures and then use them in combat. There would be over a hundred creatures to capture, including many fantasy staples like orcs, ogres, fairies and elves, as well as oversized beasts such as giant spiders and lizards, and plenty of fictional creatures that resemble mutant chimera hybrids. Each character would have unique abilities as well as weapons and items, so it was up to the player to strategize which were best suited for use in a particular battle to assemble the ideal party for the situation. They could be controlled both directly, with the player character taking on that form, or commanded in battle when given orders. The Lord of the Creatures would feature a choice of five protagonists, and would also include online play in both co-op and verses. For some reason the game was cancelled, and Spanish studio Arvarago only ever released one game on iOS in 2008. Theseus, also known as Thesis, was an action-adventure game being developed for the Xbox 360, PS3 and PC. The game had Greek themes and was also being developed by a Greek studio, Track 7 Games. Development began in 2005 and a short promo was released. The press release described it as a frantic action game with intriguing puzzles. Although the original footage shows what is clearly ancient Greece, a later 2006 E3 gameplay demo seems to show a character exploring Greek ruins in the modern day, so perhaps the story would have straddled the two time periods, exploring ancient Greece in the past as well as in the present day via archaeology. In an interview in 2006, one of the teams stated that in the game you would visit dig sites in search of ancient artefacts, reinforcing this idea. He also said that you'd encounter mythological creatures and gods from Greek mythology. They also promised an interesting story based on two rival factions, 
involving all of the debauchery and treachery you'd expect from a good Greek tale, with the player controlling two main characters. Again, maybe this is one character in each time period, I don't know. As well as real world ancient Greece, the game's locations would include those from Greek mythology such as Hades. Despite considerable promotion in 2005 and 6, Theseus vanished, presumably due to lack of a publisher. Blitz and Massive was a point and click adventure game from Portuguese Spellcaster Studios heading to the Xbox 360 and PC. Set in the future and in space, Blitz and Massive starred two robots and would be a comedic adventure with mature humour. Sadly, the only available footage is of the tutorial, so it doesn't tell us much about the gameplay, but as it's a point and click adventure game, we can pretty much assume how it would play. It does however show the game's gorgeous cell shaded graphics which look superb. Throughout the game the player would be able to switch between the two characters and control them, with each presumably having their own skills suited to certain situations. They would also each have a separate inventory. The story spoofed space shows from the 60s and 70s like Lost in Space and of course Star Trek, which Spellcaster said was their main inspiration. Blitz and Massive was planned as an episodic series, much like Telltale's games, but rather than having a continuous narrative, each of the five episodes would have a self-contained story, which would be resolved by the episode's conclusion, again emulating the TV shows they wished to parody. Spellcaster Studios cited The Secret of Monkey Island as a comparison, a bold claim indeed, as well as parody movies like Spaceballs. Presumably the two robots would have an amusing dynamic like successful buddy point and click adventures such as Sam and Max. The studio closed in 2010, at which point Blitz and Massive was cancelled. The game was almost entirely complete by this time, bar the cutscenes which were to be outsourced. Mass Effect Team Assault was a planned multiplayer first person shooter being developed by Bioware in 2010 for Xbox Live Arcade and PSN. The team described the project as a mix of Unreal Tournament and Battlefield 1943, but looking at the prototype footage it kind of feels like Halo in the Mass Effect universe. This prototype was created over a four month period, at which point the idea was scrapped and evolved into a multiplayer co-op mode for Mass Effect 3. By the time Mass Effect 3 released in 2012, this concept had morphed once again into the third person multiplayer mode that featured in the final game. Captain Blood was an action adventure game being developed for the 360 and PC by Russian studio Arkala. They had some experience with pirate games, having developed a couple of games in the Age of Pirates series among others. Captain Blood was initially meant to be an entry in this series called Age of Pirates Captain Blood and was based on the Captain Blood novels. This went through quite a lengthy development cycle beginning as far back as 2003, first planned for the original Xbox for release in 2006. We can see that there is quite a difference between the early demos when it was first announced at E3 in 2004 and more recent footage from 2009 and 2010. This was in part due to the fact that the team developing Captain Blood were bought in 2007 by 1C, at which point it underwent a design overhaul and a change of engine. It actually changed several times over its lifespan, the first demo showed some more primitive swordplay and some naval battles. The first metamorphosis came in-house when the initial concept was restarted at Arcala when the team working on it left the company in late 2003. This led to the first trailer at E3 in 2004, seen here. Then in 2005 it was again changed to be more of a pirate hack and slash, with fast and violent combat, which looks more like a beat em up in terms of gameplay style, but it did retain some aspects like the naval combat. And then it of course changed again when 1C purchased the team in the game, becoming this god of war like brawler, as well as the alterations in quality due to the upgraded 3D engine. In this guise, Captain Blood was to feature this hack and slash gameplay combined with a mission based story. Players would be able to invade and loot enemy ships and at least some form of naval combat remained with the demo showing cannons being operated to attack rival vessels. 
The player character could upgrade their equipment and abilities through victory in combat by gaining experience as well as pirate booty which could be used to buy better weapons and gear, and presumably more able ships. Initially planned for a 2009 release for the 360, it was delayed once again until 2012 and then there was an ongoing dispute between 1C and the publisher Play Logic, which resulted in a protracted legal battle which eventually caused the game's cancellation. It seems that Captain Blood was all but complete by this time, so it's awful for the developers who put so many years into this. Plus, I'm a sucker for a good pirate game, so this one is a real shame. Recoil Retrograd was a third person action adventure being developed between 2006 and 2008 by Danish studio Zeitgeist for the 360, PS3 and PC. The game centres around time travel. The player character can travel into the past, change the outcome of events and then return to the present to see the consequences of their actions on the timeline. The game world, ruled by a group of psychics called Cardinals, has diesel punk themes which blend steam powered and futuristic technology, reminiscent of games like Bioshock Infinite and Dishonored. The story, written by Dane Morton Iverson, who had previously written for the Hitman series, starts in the year 2052, but soon the protagonist uses an artifact called the Halo to travel back to the year 1807. The plot drew from several influences, including Stephen Hawking's physics and science fiction stories involving time travel. The focal point was the so-called butterfly effect, whereby seemingly minor changes in the past would have a domino effect far into the future, changing the timeline significantly. Because of this, Recall would offer the player a lot of replay value, as they could redo a level in various ways to experience every possible outcome based on the available actions and choices. This unique selling point generated quite the buzz, with a board game being mocked up and even Ridley Scott showing interest in the film rights. Plus, the game itself had a lot of big name publishers interested. 2008 wasn't a good year for businesses worldwide and sadly, for whatever reason, Recall was cancelled, likely due to the lack of a publisher. This seems odd considering the amount of interest surrounding the project, but there was also talk of licensing rights issues with some of the game's content, so perhaps that was a factor. There seem to be a lot of games on this list starting with Project, and another is Project X, which was an action game being developed for the 360 and PS3 by Z Axis to be published by Activision. A prototype was created but sadly gives us little information as it's so brief. It seems like the playable character could use various powers, and use these powers to take on enemies. In the video the character begins surrounded by some sort of energy, I'm not sure if this is electricity or ice, and then changes to being shrouded in fire. Perhaps other powers would be available throughout, and switching between these would be necessary to suit situations, with certain enemy types being vulnerable to different powers, and puzzles and or obstacles being overcome through their use as well. Z-Axis was closed by Activision in 2010, and Project X was one of the casualties. Definitely one of the more interesting games on the list was The Crossing, a first person shooter from Arcane Studios heading to the Xbox 360 and PC. Set in Paris, two realities are about to collide. The trailer asks the question, what if the Knights Templar had survived 1307? One reality sees a modern day Paris where the government has collapsed and anarchy rules the streets, and one where the Knights Templar had survived. You could travel between these realities by the use of portals. The gameplay in the regular Paris was more like a traditional tactical FPS, whereas in the Templar universe you could use Assassin's Creed like gear, including grappling hooks and an integrated wrist blade. Designed and directed by Viktor Antonov, who was art director on Half Life 2 and Dishonored, The Crossing was pushing a feature called Cross Player as its USP. In fact, the trailer calls it the first crossplayer FPS ever. Crossplayer would blend single player with multiplayer, which meant that, if desired, the player could allow other players to join the game at any time and control enemies, thus replacing the enemy AI with online players. 
a first person shooter where NPCs can be players, fusing single player with multiplayer. Interesting idea. The idea was conceived around 2005 when Arkane were discussing ideas for new IPs. Having been very focused on strong single player games, they wanted to dip their toes into multiplayer and the crossing would be a compromise having elements of both. The player would play through the campaign and come to several points where online players could load in to control enemies. During this time the player would be shown a cutscene to not only break up the areas and advance the story, but also to give the other players time to take control of an enemy and assume strategic positions. This wasn't a simple undertaking and Arcane were forced to rethink the way in which they approached level design. This dynamic would also greatly affect the way the player would approach the game as it became impossible to predict enemy behaviour when a level was replayed or restarted because of course the enemy AI could be controlled by real world players and different players every time. In the end The Crossing was a hard sell to publishers. It was a new IP which would be quite a costly investment and many doubted the viability of implementing this cross player feature successfully. Arcane had a publishing deal lined up which they reportedly found unsatisfactory and The Crossing was cancelled by Arcane around 2009 with them losing around $1 million worth of investment into this project. Freelancer 2 was a planned sequel to Freelancer, a space combat flight sim released on PC in 2003, which itself was a sequel to 2000's Star Lancer on PC and Dreamcast. It was being developed by Digital Anvil and Microsoft Game Studios for the Xbox 360 under the working title Project Lone Star. As well as featuring space combat, the game would have an emphasis on trading. The player could choose from several pilots and ships, exploring a large number of solar systems and the respective planets and space stations, and making money via trading, bounty hunting and piracy. The original Freelancer on PC supported 128 player multiplayer, so it's likely that this sequel would have featured one too, although unlikely at such a scale. The game was cancelled in January 2006 when Microsoft dissolved Digital Anvil. Gun Loco was a third person shooter from Square Enix exclusively for the Xbox 360 which they described as a sprint action shooter with both single and multiplayer modes. This description as well as the gameplay footage reminds me of Sega's The Club. All the action takes place while on the go, sprinting around the environments while taking cover and shooting. Set on a prison planet, the player takes control of one of several criminals. The prison is devoid of all authority so the prisoners fight to take control. It would have included both deathmatch like combat and mission based gameplay. The main game is played from a frantic shaky camera third person viewpoint to simulate the motion and hectic pace, and cutscenes in between levels were a hand drawn 2D style. Gun Loco was cancelled without explanation by Square Enix in 2011. War Devil was an action game for the Xbox 360 and PS3 from DigiGuys, a studio under the Ignition Entertainment umbrella. This went by two names during development, War Devil Enigma and War Devil Unleash the Beast Within. A prototype demo was created early on in 2005 which demonstrated that it was quite capable in the graphics department. The project actually started as a tech demo conceived before the Xbox 360 was even named and DigiGuys aimed to create high quality 1080p visuals at 60 frames per second. The story and theme are not clear, you play as the titular War Devil, an ultimate killing machine. It looks like it has a mixture of classical and futuristic elements, combining historic armour and architecture with robotic enemies. War Devil was said to have considerable fighting skills, being proficient with bladed weapons and utilising martial arts and supernatural powers. Although the graphic engine was impressive, it seems that the game itself was not developed to any playable state, despite being in development for a whopping 6 years from 2004 to 2010. Eventually the Xbox 360 version was cancelled in favour of a single platform release on PS3, but even that was eventually scrapped. DigiGuys were closed down in 2010, 
so a lengthy development on War Devil as well as a considerable financial investment were wasted. Chase was an action adventure game with a heavy focus on driving being developed for the 360 and PS3. Strangely there doesn't seem to be any concrete info on who was actually developing this, although it was rumoured to have evolved games on board as a publisher. This footage is of a tech demo created for Chase. It was developed in 2010, so well into the Xbox 360's life, and it looks absolutely stunning. In fact, of all the games on this list, I think it's by far the most visually impressive. The game world and the vehicles look very real indeed, and the lighting effects and explosions are particularly satisfying. It's set in the real world USA and would feature 12 different cities across the state, including San Francisco, Salt Lake City and New York. One would assume that it's set in the near future, as it looks like everything's gone a bit Mad Max. The story followed two playable characters, Logan and Gina Chase, as they uncover a sinister plot surrounding a secret organisation called the Hand of the Patriots, who plan to send the US spiralling into anarchy. It would feature two core elements, the vehicular combat of course, and also on foot third person shooter. The driving sections look absolutely fantastic, with some huge weaponry built into the car. The full game would feature numerous vehicles including cars, trucks and various sea vessels, all of which would be customisable and upgradable. Driving missions would include things like pursuing and taking down an enemy vehicle, like a modern day version of Chase HQ. It would also feature a multiplayer vehicular combat mode. I don't know if it ever made it past this tech demo stage because we don't even know who developed it, but needless to say Chase never saw the light of day. Black Death was a survival horror first person shooter being developed by French studio Darkwork. A playable prototype was created to pitch the idea which was released in 2011. The story sought to capitalise on the fear caused by some recent pandemics, an idea that's sadly even more relevant today. The east coast of America has been hit by a huge cloud of fog of unknown origin which infects anyone with which it comes into contact. Once infected with this mysterious disease, sufferers mutate into savage creatures. These creatures or zombies then exhibit herd behaviour and wield various powers. The player character sets out into the city in an attempt to survive the fog and the infected population and ultimately uncover the truth behind the origin of the deadly fog. Darkworks promised an open gameplay style, allowing the player freedom to play how they wanted and to even create their own custom weapons. This would be partially achieved through the collection of several reagents, which could then be combined and added to your chosen weaponry. The gameplay shows a gas mask wearing protagonist using various melee weapons and firearms, but also shows one of these reagents in action, which petrifies enemies. The creation of said reagents would be achieved via a minigame. We can assume that the addition of reagents not only opened up some flexibility in tactics and approach, but they would also be suited to certain situations, given that the infected had different powers. The enemies would be quick and hard to kill, and the gameplay was to be faster than you would expect from many survival horror games. Keeping yourself free from infection was key as well, hence the gas mask. Apparently it would also be possible to cure enemies rather than kill them, again opening up a gameplay choice for the player. Announced in 2011, Black Death never made it past the pitching stage. Darkworks were unable to secure a publisher and subsequently closed. Cypher Complex was a third person stealth action game being developed for the 360, PS3 and PC by Edge of Reality to be published by Sega. The story blended covert espionage with science fiction starring a black ops agent called John Sullivan, codenamed Cypher, infiltrating foreign facilities and neutralising terrorist threats. What begins as a simple recon expedition soon snowballs into a full-blown terrorist conspiracy with global implications. The unique aspect of Cypher Complex was this sort of instant dash move. I'm not sure if this is supposed to be a superpower or an effect of the suit he's wearing, but it's probably the latter given the storyline. 
This allows the player to select a position or move to execute indicated by these white character outlines then committing to that move makes it happen instantaneously as if the character is teleporting instantly to that location. These moves can be anything from acrobatic moves like wall running, jumps and grabs to attacks including wrestling like holds, stealth kills and so on. Kills are primarily executed using this rather large knife. The idea was to chain these instant dash moves together allowing the player to chain together attacks taking out several enemies in a short space of time. Actually pulling this off looks like it might have been rather tricky though. Development on Cypher Complex began in 2005 with Sega coming on board as publisher in 2007. It was cancelled in 2009 and it was initially believed that this was Sega's doing but Edge of Reality have since stated that it was their decision although offered no reasoning. LMNO was an action game being developed by EA for the Xbox 360 and PS3 between 2005 and 2010. The interesting thing about this title is that Steven Spielberg was involved as part of a three franchise deal he'd signed with EA in 2005. It would be a mix of first person parkour gameplay akin to Mirror's Edge and RPG elements with a heavy focus on what they called escape gameplay. The story followed the player character as secret service agent and his or her relationship with Eve, an elongated alien-like character with special powers including the ability to communicate with the player character telepathically. The escape gameplay would trigger when pursuing agents to send on the duo resulting in frantic action sequences in which the pair need to evade them. Co-op combo attacks could be executed using the two characters but the main goal was evasion rather than engagement. LMNO also aimed to evoke an emotional reaction from players and an early teaser shows a solitary tear running down Eve's face posing the question can a computer game make you cry? In 2008 EA stripped the game back to something less complicated making it more of a traditional action game and it was renamed The Escape Artist but that never happened either. Mega Man Universe was a digital only game being developed at Capcom for Xbox Live Arcade and PSN. This was a sort of create your own Mega Man game, very much like Little Big Planet and Super Mario Maker. First announced in 2010, Capcom teased the game and then showed a playable demo later that year featuring three levels. Players would be able to create and share their own fiendish Mega Man levels using a set library of assets including building blocks, items, hazards and enemies and they would also be able to create and share their own custom characters. The playable characters shown off included Ryu from Street Fighter, Arthur from Ghosts and Goblins and of course several versions of Mega Man including the hilariously bad western box art version. Presumably the final game would have featured many more characters from the Mega Man franchise having many iterations of Mega Man in countless forms as well as boss enemies and characters from the Capcom universe in general. Players could mix and match different body parts from these characters to create their own custom look and choose their desired abilities and special weapons. Perhaps the most impressive aspect of the level customization was the ability for the player to dictate the enemy AI, choosing their behaviours, movements and damage dealt. A patent filed by Capcom for this feature was discovered sometime after the game's cancellation. The available level assets look like they're based on the early NES Mega Man games, but the graphical style is updated with a 2.5D look. The development team included several Capcom staff who had worked on the earlier Mega Man games. In the same vein as Mario Maker, creators would need to defeat their custom created levels before being able to share them with other players online. Even though Mega Man Universe was reportedly quite a way into production, in early 2011 Capcom announced the project's cancellation. They said it was because of various circumstances at the time, but it's speculated that quality issues were one of the main causes. Hellion Mystery of the Inquisition was an action RPG from Polish Flying Fish Studios in development for the Xbox 360, PS3 and PC. Played from a first person perspective, 
Helion was set in medieval times across several European locations. It would be based more on real historical characters and events rather than being fantasy, although it would have its fair share of the supernatural too. The player would be able to summon divine powers to exorcise demons from possessed enemies. In fact, the whole thing has religious overtones. The story would involve the Inquisition formed by the church in the 12th century to combat heresy. Helion was set in the 13th century with a story surrounding a plot to overthrow the church and open a portal to hell, and Flying Frisch reportedly did extensive research on the Inquisition for the complex plot. Each European location would have its own distinct cultures and politics, enveloping the player in all manner of drama, and notable factions from history would be present, such as the Knights Templar. Development began in 2009 with a planned 2011 release, and the graphics look jolly nice for the time. The available gameplay footage shows much of what you'd expect from a medieval setting, knights, monks, plenty of churches and other Christian references. The combat seems to be mainly sword play and medieval projectile weapons like crossbows. Plus there is the exorcism mechanic and subsequent demon fight. The sword wielding combat lets you block attacks as well as dismember or even behead your enemies. Looking at it you'd be forgiven for thinking that this was an open world game like the Elder Scrolls but Hellion was to be a more linear affair with levels. When it was cancelled 10 of the 13 planned levels had been completed. I'm not exactly sure why it was cancelled, but it's possible that Hellion was just another casualty of the financial crisis hitting many studios at the time. Brothers in Arms Furious 4 was a planned entry in the Brothers in Arms series of first person shooters being developed by Gearbox Software for the Xbox 360, PS3 and PC to be published by Ubisoft. This would be quite the departure from series standards, rather than striving for realism it would be more of a comical and over the top take on World War II. It starred a band of four larger than life soldiers, shooting their way through Nazi Germany in 1944, leaving destruction in their wake. The four characters were Stitch, a taser wielding Irishman, Crockett, a Texan who marks fallen enemies with a branding iron, Chock, a Native American armed with a tomahawk, and Montana, an absolute mountain of a man brandishing a minigun. The characters were introduced in a brief trailer which is reminiscent of the bar scene in Inglorious Bastards. Not much is known about the team dynamic during gameplay, so we have no idea when you control each character. Was it a case of commanding the team and switching between characters on the fly, or controlling one character per mission? I'm not sure. Gearbox are well known for the Borderlands series, so it's safe to assume that the FPS gameplay would be in a similar vein. The available gameplay footage looks very frantic and exaggerated. It was first unveiled at E3 in 2011, but in 2012 the Brothers in Arms IP transferred to Gearbox. Eventually Gearbox shared concerns that it was just too different to be labelled a Brothers in Arms game. For one, the series was known for its historical accuracy and Furious 4 took several artistic liberties. So it was decided that it would be renamed simply Furious 4, becoming a brand new standalone IP. But in 2015 they announced that Furious 4 had been scrapped altogether, a shame as it looks like a fun take on the genre. Seemingly some of Furious 4's assets made their way into Gearbox's 2016 game Battleborn, most notably the character Montana. Elvian was a fantasy action adventure game from Slovakian Tentacle Studios initially being developed for the Xbox 360 and PC. Development started as far back as 2003 as an action game with RPG elements, Set in a fantasy world, Elvian's story was set in the formative stages of this world, where elves were still a relatively young race. Combat would be third person and involved the execution of precise attacks and button combos. As this was a large part of the game, Tentacle spent time motion capturing all the movements with each weapon to make the attacks and blocks look authentic. A multiplayer mode of some sort was also planned. In 2008 the game was bought by Climax who made several changes to the project, 
chiefly that it would now be an Xbox 360 and PS3 title, and the RPG gameplay was switched up to incorporate a hub from which you would explore several dungeons. Fast forward seven years and it's changed hands again, with some former Tentacle Studios employees reacquiring the project in 2015, but it seems this version was again cancelled. A strange one here, 12 years in the making off and on, and a total of three separate cancellations. Bonk Brink of Extinction was a platform game that was to be released digitally on Xbox Live Arcade as well as on PSN and Wii. This footage is of the Xbox 360 version from 2010's E3. It was being developed by Hudson Soft, which is obvious if you're familiar with Bonk as a character. If you're not, Bonk, also known as BC Kid, was the mascot for NEC's TurboGrafx-16 console or PC Engine in Japan, where he was known as PC Genjin. This was a play on PC Engine, with the word Genjin meaning something like primitive man. In Brink of Extinction, his world is in danger of being wiped out by a meteor, presumably a nod to the extinction level event that the dinosaurs suffered 65 million years ago. Bonk's primary weapon is his massive head, which he uses to nut the living daylights out of his enemies. Enemies are usually prehistoric creatures, but there are some mechanical contraptions too. The time period is very confused, featuring people, machines and various landmarks from throughout history within a prehistoric setting. In addition to his unstoppable headbutt, Bonk can transform into upgraded versions of himself, including Fire Bonk, Ice Bonk, Mini Bonk and Rhino Bonk. Each has an associated ability, like the power to shoot fireballs, icy breath, etc. The names are pretty self-explanatory. These power-ups would not only assist in defeating enemies, but allow Bonk to solve puzzles or reach previously inaccessible areas. The graphics are a far cry from any of Bonk's previous console iterations, but that's hardly surprising considering there is a gap of over a decade between this and the last one. This is still a 2D platformer, but has 3D graphics and more of a sense of depth to the levels. The level design looks pretty good, incorporating puzzles into the mix, but it was nothing we hadn't seen before. Despite Bonk's more modern 3D appearance, some of the graphics used on the menu overlays and on the world map do use Bonk's traditional 2D drawn style. Hudson Soft cancelled Brink of Extinction in March of 2011, and it's rumoured that this was due to the earthquake and tsunami disaster. Six Days in Fallujah was a third-person tactical shooter being developed for the 360, PS3 and PC by Atomic Games to be published by Konami. The story was set in Iraq during 2004 and followed a squad of marines during the Battle of Fallujah over a period of six days, hence the name. It was in fact to be the first game to cover the war in Iraq. Atomic's aim was to create the most realistic military shooter yet, and were in quite a unique position to do so. They had experience with developing training tools for US Marines, and as such had some on-hand advice on the game's content. In fact, the whole idea came from a Marine who had fought in Iraq, and suggested a game based on his experiences. They also read literature on the war, and interviewed many other Marines, as well as historians and even Iraqi citizens, to get as realistic an overview of the conflict as possible. The original plan was to release in 2010, but unfortunately the game garnered a lot of negative press. It seems it was a bit too soon for people to accept a game based on this mess of a war, especially one that strived to portray a realistic account of its events. The backlash was particularly fierce from British veterans, so Konami pulled out of publishing in 2009. It seemed to be in limbo for a while with no publisher, but Sony showed interest in 2012, although nothing has happened since. Atomic Games have stated as recently as 2018 that Six Days in Fallujah is not officially cancelled, so who knows, maybe we will see it one day. Road Trip working title Project T was a zombie survival adventure game being developed by French studio Hydrovision for the Xbox 360 and PS3. Work on the game began in 2009 with the aim to create an open world zombie game that delivered a constant state of stress and danger. 
It followed two main protagonists, a male and female, TJ and Maria, and their struggle to survive in this zombie ridden wasteland, scavenging for supplies and most importantly, trying to stay alive. This idea of a zombie survival game focusing on a platonic relationship between a male and female character is rather similar to The Last of Us. During the game you would be able to control either TJ or Maria, each having their own abilities and weaknesses. Hydrovision took inspiration from popular zombie media, including things like The Walking Dead and modern zombie films, and this is apparent from the demo footage. One minute the player character is quietly searching an abandoned shop for valuable supplies, and the next they're surrounded by a horde of zombies. Stealth and ingenuity were a must, as the zombies were very fast and aggressive if alerted. Getting around was facilitated by the use of an upgradable van. This brought with it more problems too because of course you would need fuel, which wasn't exactly easy to obtain, but essentially it acted as a mini base wherein the player could store items and heal, etc. Environmental objects could be interacted with too, allowing the player to create barricades and obstacles as protection, or to kill enemies for example by blowing up gas tanks. Over time you would build up a small community of survivors and would need to keep them healthy and alive. The community's base camp would act as the game's main hub, with different areas offering different missions and rewards. The base camp itself would need to be fortified and defended too, from incoming attacks from zombie hordes, as well as from human raiders. Saving people would result in them joining your community, and NPCs would each have certain skills to bring to the table, for example saving someone skilled in farming would increase food production. It's a great concept for a game and it seems like it could have been epic in scale, I could even see this being reworked into a Walking Dead game with great success. Hydrovision pitched Road Trip to several publishers, but the reaction was that it was far too ambitious for a team of their size, so nobody took it on. Perhaps it was a little ahead of its time. In 2010 it was cancelled after about a year of work, and Hydrovision went under in 2012. So that was 35 of the many many cancelled Xbox 360 games. As always let me know in the comments if any of these tickled your fancy and thanks for watching. You can find the rest of the cancelled game series in this playlist.